Okay, hello everybody. This is Dr. Wright here. Wanted to do a supplemental lecture for Chapter 7, speaking specifically about the yield curve. And as the One Republic song goes, I'm going to go ahead and give away all my secrets right here at the beginning. So we're going to call the yield curve the crystal ball for recessions. And I hope that that preview is enough to sort of keep you in suspense and keep you tuned in. So let's jump right in. Remember, what we've been talking about lately is this idea that there could be information out there that a lot of people would like to have, but for whatever reason, there could be a wall separating most of the economic agents from that information. That's frustrating. However, markets can help us with this. So imagine that there are, that there are people standing on the top of that wall or perhaps riding a bike, as you see in this picture. Either way, there are people on top of the wall who can actually see the information, even though most of us can't. But if those people on top of that wall will create a market and start trading financial instruments based on the information that they see, then even if the rest of us can't see the information, as long as we can see the changes to the prices in that financial market, we can make educated inferences about what's happening to the information. So specifically, what we're suggesting is there is important information about the macro economy that many of us either don't have access to or we don't have the time and the resources to get our minds around it or to get our eyes in front of it. So, and, and this could be information about manufacturing statistics. This could be information about consumer sentiment. It could be a whole host of variables. It could be information about GDP, inflation. For whatever reason, there are traders, there are economic agents on the top of the wall that do have access and they do have the time to uh, synthesize and digest and analyze this information. Well, as long as they're trading a financial instrument and we can see the price changes, we can glean information about the macro economy simply through the changes in the prices in those markets. And so we said that in the bond market, there were two tools that we were going to use to try to make inferences from prevailing market prices or yields to try to gain some insights about the macro economy. And those two tools are the credit spread and the yield curve. We talked last class about what the credit spread is. I'm not going to review that now. I'll simply say that we concluded last class by saying that the credit spread can be thought of as the Richter scale for recessions. In this supplemental lecture, we want to turn our attention to the yield curve. This is a very typical representation of the yield curve. Let me try to explain to you what this is. Generally, the yield curve is a snapshot at any one point in time. And it's a snapshot of the yields to maturity that are prevailing in the treasury market. What we do is we take a picture at any point in time and on the x-axis, we map out the different uh, times to maturity for the various treasury instruments. Then on the y-axis, we map out the corresponding yields to maturity. So we might go and find the current yield right now, the yield to maturity, on a one-year treasury, and we map it out, and there it would be. We might go and see, well, what's the prevailing yield to maturity right now on a five-year treasury, and then we map it out. And we would do the same thing for a 30-year and a 20-year. Now, please note, this graph, this image, typically only captures treasuries. And because of that, this graph is capturing the yield to maturity on bonds that are similar in almost every respect except time to maturity. And importantly, this graph is sanitized of any default risk effects. So remember, the credit spread was a measure of changes in macro level default risk. This graph, the yield, the yield curve, is going to be sanitized and scrubbed of all default risk because the only thing we're analyzing are treasuries, which we generally don't believe have any default risk. So all we're measuring here in the yield curve is the difference in the yields to maturity that is a function of different times to maturity. So with that background, let's move forward. And I have to warn you, we have to do a lot of framing. We have to put up a lot of two by four studs before we can actually build the house that we want today. So bear with me as we do quite a bit of framing. There are three stylized facts about the yield curve. Stylized fact number one is that bond, the yields on bonds with similar characteristics 
but different times to maturity tend to move together. What I mean to say is there's a positive correlation between the yields to maturity of bonds that are similar but have different times to maturity. And I have data that I want to try to use to show this to you. So what I've done here in this graph that you can see is I have just graphed from 1990 to 2010, so about a 20 year period, I have graphed the prevailing yield to maturity on one year treasuries, 10 year treasuries, and five year treasuries. If you engage in what my friend Craig Merrill calls ocular analysis, if you just use the eyeball test, you can see that there is, in fact, positive correlation. Now, for those of you who are statistics junkies and you don't want to just rely on ocular analysis, I've also calculated the correlations. The correlations highlighted in yellow are what I showed you in this graph. So, for instance, you can see that the correlation between one-year treasury yields and five-year treasury yields is 0.931. The correlation between one-year yields and 10-year yields is 0.847. Please notice that all of these correlations, all of these correlations are approaching one. So we see, in fact, that this stylized fact holds. Yes, indeed, the yields, on bond, the yields to maturity on bonds with different times to maturity have positive correlation. The second stylized fact about the yield curve is that yields to maturity, not prices, yields to maturity on short-term bonds are more volatile than yields to maturity on long-term bonds. Let's say that again. The yields to maturity on short-term bonds are more volatile than the yields to maturity on long-term bonds. Now, again, you can sort of see this in the ocular analysis. Notice that the blue line, which is the yields to maturity on one-year treasuries, Notice that that blue line has much deeper troughs, right? So we can see that the volatility, the up and down of the line is much greater for the blue line, whereas the red line, which is the 10-year treasury yield, tends to move in a much tighter range, a much tighter bound. Now, for those of you who, again, aren't sold on simply ocular analysis, let's use some statistics. So what I've calculated here is the variance covariance matrix, which most of you wouldn't be interested in. But I've also calculated the variance. Now, you've all either taken a stats class or done the summer stats boot camp. You should know what variance is. Variance is the average squared deviation around the mean. That's a mouthful, but all it means in layman's terms is that variance is one of our standard measures of how much variation there is in a particular data set. Notice that the variance is much higher for short-term treasuries than it is for long-term treasuries. So we see both in the ocular analysis, the blue line has much lower troughs. There's much more variation. That's the one-year treasury. And also, we can see that the variance on the one-year treasury is much higher than the variance on a five- or ten-year treasury. So, okay, I hope that I've demonstrated to you that these first two stylized facts related to the yield curve are uh, validated and corroborated by the data. Okay, the third stylized fact related to the yield curve is that it generally slopes upwards. Let me try to show this to you. What I've done here is I've just created a little macro that I can use to show you the yield curve over time. So here's the yield curve in the late 80s. And I hope you can see that whether I'm clicking forward or backward, I hope you can see that that yield curve generally slopes upwards. And I could take you through more episodes in history, but I hope I've shown you enough just to make you feel comfortable with the idea that this truly is the general shape of the yield curve. Okay, so these are the three stylized facts about the yield curve. The yields to maturity on bonds with different times to maturity are positively correlated. Number two, the yields to maturity on short-term bonds are more volatile than the yields to maturity on long-term bonds. And number three, the yield curve tends to slope upwards. All right, it's been my experience that most students can wrap their minds around stylized fact one and stylized fact three. But some students struggle to comprehend stylized fact number two, and here's why they struggle to understand this. In our previous lecture, 
we talked about interest rate risk. What we said is there's an inverse relationship between yields to maturity and prices. And that interest rate risk represents the length of the lever. And we have a measure for interest rate risk. It's called duration. And if you remember, what drives duration generally is time to maturity. So what we said yesterday is that a bond with a longer time to maturity is going to have bigger price swings. So that's confusing because what I just said about the yield curve is that the yields on short-term bonds are more volatile than the yields on long-term bonds. But what we said yesterday is that the prices on long-term bonds will swing more widely. There will be greater volatility in the price of long-term bonds than short-term bonds. That seems on the surface to be contradictory. Here's the key to understanding it. Yesterday, what we were saying is, imagine that the yield to maturity moves by 1%. What bond will have the biggest price swing? And yesterday, we said long-term bonds will have the bigger price swing because the duration will be longer and the length of the lever will be longer. That was yesterday. What I'm saying right now is, I'm not asking what the price swing is going to be. What I'm asking is, what's the probability of a swing in the yield to maturity? And so what I'm telling you is that short-term bonds have bigger swings in the yield to maturity. But what we said yesterday is, if two bonds have the same swing in the yield to maturity, then a longer-term bond would have a bigger price change. So that's how we reconcile that. Okay, so again, those are our three stylized facts about the yield curve. What we now want to do, again, we're framing the house right now. We're putting up two by fours. Hang with me. What we want to do now is we want to find explanations for these stylized facts. And I promise you there's an important punchline at the, all of, at the end of all of this framing. Okay, so there have been two possible explanations for these three stylized facts that have been proposed. There's something called the expectations hypothesis, and there's something called the liquidity premium theory. Let's start with the expectations hypothesis. Here's what the expectations hypothesis says. The yield to maturity on a long-term bond represents the average yield to maturity that investors expect on short-term bonds over that period. Here's a way to think of it graphically. Whatever the yield to maturity on a 10-year bond is right now, that's going to be the average of what we think the yield to maturity will be on a one-year bond over each of the next 10 years. Let me give you an even clearer demonstration of this. Imagine that investors believe over the next five years, this will be the yield to maturity on a one-year treasury. So this year we think the yield will be 1.5, next year we think 1.75, then we think it will hold at that for another year, then it will bump up to 2% for two more years. The expectations hypothesis says, if that's what investors believe about the yield to maturity on one-year treasury bonds, then right now, the yield on a five-year treasury bond should be the geometric average of those five years worth of expectations about the one-year treasury. So if you go ahead and calculate the geometric average of these five one-year treasury yields, you would get 1.8%. So what the expectations hypothesis says, if that's what the market believes about one-year yields over the next five years, that's what the five-year yield should be right now. And here's why. If this is in fact what happens over the next five years, then you have two options when it comes to investing. You could invest each year in a one-year treasury and earn those returns. Alternatively, you could just invest all of your money right now in a five-year treasury bond. And the expectations hypothesis says that investors should be indifferent between those two options. So if you look at how that would play out, here's what would happen. Imagine that you have $10,000 and you decide to use the first strategy. Each year, you're going to invest in a one-year treasury bond. So the first year, you'll earn 1.5% and you'll have 10,150. The second year, you'll invest all that and you'll earn 1.75% and you'll end up with $10,328. 
Then you'll invest all that at 1.75 again. You'll get 10,508. Then for the next two years, you'll invest your money at 2%. You'll end up with $10,932.90. Alternatively, you could just invest in the one five-year treasury bond whose yield right now is simply the average of all of these one-year treasury yields that we expect over the next five years. If you invest in that one year treasure or that one, sorry, if you invest in that one five year bond, then you would earn 1.8% each year for the next five years and you would end up with 10,932.90. And you can see that you're indifferent between those two alternatives. So this is the idea of the expectations hypothesis. It just says that the yield to maturity on long term treasuries is the average of whatever we think the yield to maturity will be on one year treasuries over that time period. Well, this expectations hypothesis is very helpful in explaining these stylized facts about the yield curve. Specifically, it does a great job of explaining the first stylized fact that the yield to maturity on bonds with different times to maturity are positively correlated. Let me show you why that's the case. Imagine that, you know, right now the yield to maturity is 1.5%, but what if that suddenly spikes to 2.5%? Watch what will happen to the yield on a five year bond right now. It will also go up. So this bond went from 1.5 to 2%. This bond went from 1.8 to 2. So we can see, sorry, this bond went up to 2.5%. The five-year treasury goes up to 2%. So, yeah, the expectations hypothesis explains very nicely why the yields to maturity on bonds with different times to maturity are positively correlated. It also explains really cleanly why, yields to, why the yields to maturity on short-term bonds are more volatile than the yields to maturity on long-term bonds. Let me show you why. So, again, coming back to our example, Notice that the yield to maturity on a five-year bond is the average of these five one-year treasury yields. If we change the one-year treasury yield to 2.5, so that's a pretty big pop, we get an increase in the five-year, but not as much, right? So this bond, the one-year bond went up by a percent. The five-year only went up by 2%, that, but that's because the five-year yield is the average of these four four yields. So of course you're going to get more volatility in the one year than you would the five year because the five year is averaging against four other yields. So okay, expectations hypothesis is awesome for explaining the first two stylized facts. However, it doesn't really do anything to explain why the yield curve tends to slope upwards. Look, the only way that you would get an upward sloping yield curve in the expectations hypothesis is if you consistently, frequently believed that the yield to maturity on a one-year treasury bond is going to be constantly going up in the future. Think about that. The only way you get an upward sloping yield curve using the expectations hypothesis is if you think that the one-year treasury yield will be increasing over time. Now, I've structured that right here. So if we were to draw the yield curve right now, the yield on a one-year treasury is 1.5%. The yield on a five-year treasury is 1.8%. You can see that from what I've built right here. Here's the prevailing one-year yield. Here's the prevailing five-year yield. But the only reason that that's happening is because I've built the expectation that yields will be going up. But there's no reason to believe that. We could just as easily believe that treasury yields are going to go down over the next five years. And if that's the case, we would actually get a downward sloping yield curve. So the expectations hypothesis helps us with two of the stylized facts, but it falls short in explaining the third stylized fact. This is where we have to call upon the liquidity premium theory. Now, technically, the liquidity premium theory says that illiquidity drives yields higher. Practically speaking, 
this is what we think of when we think of the liquidity premium theory. Bonds that have longer times to maturity will necessarily have higher yields to maturity. This is because, and this is a tautology, bonds with longer times to maturity have longer duration. They have higher interest rate risk. We talked about this when we looked at the teeter-totter. Remember that the length of the lever, interest rate risk, that is duration. And duration is driven by time to maturity. So if you have a bond with a longer time to maturity, it's going to have longer duration, higher interest rate risk. Well, risk requires compensation. So if bonds with longer times to maturity have higher interest rate risk, they're going to have to have higher yields to maturity. This is very helpful. In essence, what we're saying is the liquidity premium theory clearly explains why the yield curve should slope upwards. It's because as you go farther out on the yield curve, as you go farther out on the yield curve, these bonds out here 20 and 30 years have longer duration and higher interest rate risk. So because they have a higher interest rate risk, they have to have higher yields to maturity. So this graph right here is a nice way to think about the yield curve. Much of it is explained by the expectations hypothesis, but some of it is explained by the liquidity premium theory. But now, okay, now we've done a lot of framing. We've put up a lot of two by fours and we shot in a lot of nails. Now we're going to start building the house because here's where it gets interesting. What if the yield curve didn't slope upwards? What if for whatever reason, and we know it would be abnormal because the yield curve normally looks like this, but what if for some unique, peculiar reason, the yield curve sloped downwards? What would be driving that? Would it be the liquidity premium theory or the expectations hypothesis? Well, it turns out it can't be the liquidity premium theory. Remember, as you go out on the yield curve, bonds have higher interest rate risk. So according to the liquidity premium theory, they have to have higher yield to maturity. So if the yield curve is downward sloping, it has to be a function of the expectations hypothesis. Notice that the area in red is still growing like it has to, right? Again, higher interest rate risk has to have higher yields to maturity. So a downward sloping yield curve has to be driven by the expectations hypothesis. Okay, this is one of the first punchlines of the, of the lecture today. An inverted yield curve is a signal that the market believes that the yields on short-term treasuries will decline measurably in the next year or two. Let me say that again. An inverted yield curve is a signal that the markets must believe that the yields to maturity on one-year treasuries are going to be declining in the future. That's the only way to explain an inverted yield curve. So the question quickly becomes, what is most likely to make yields in the bond markets decline. Well, this gets back to something we talked about last week. And this is one of the things I love about this class, right, is we connect dots throughout the semester. So I painted some stars for you in the sky last week. Now we're going to draw the constellations. Here's my question. We know that an inverted yield curve is a signal that yields are going to decline, which is another way of saying that prices are going to increase. So the question I'm asking you is, what would make the prices in the bond market increase and the yields decrease? So we need to figure out what would shift supply backwards and, and what would shift demand outward? Well, it turns out that what would create that movement, so what would move supply back and demand out most commonly and most convincingly would be expectations that inflation will decline. If everyone in the market believes that inflation is going to, to, is going to decline, think about the impact that will have. People issuing bonds will not want to issue bonds right now. They would rather wait for inflation to decline. People buying bonds would be very excited 
about buying bonds right now if inflation is going to decline in the future. So if the market believes that inflation is going to decline, you would see this take place and prices would go up and yields would decrease. So what we said back here is an inverted yield curve is a sign that the markets believe short-term treasuries will decline, the yields on short-term treasuries will decline. What's most likely to make the yields in the bond market decline is if everyone thinks inflation is going to decline. So an inverted yield curve is a signal that the market anticipates declining inflation, which leads to the next question. What typically causes declining inflation? Well, the easiest way for me to demonstrate this to you is to simply show you some data. So here's what I want to show you. This is inflation. This is the time period. I'm going to show you inflation sort of a normal time period here. Oh, forgive me, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so let's go back to like pre-crisis. So 2005, inflation's at 3%, 4%, 4%. 2007, we're at 4%, 4%, 4.9%. And in July of 2008, we hit 5.5%, 5.3%. .5 now watch what happens as we hit the crisis. As we hit the crisis, inflation declines precipitously. So the answer to this question, what typically causes declining inflation? The answer to that question is recession. So here's the punchline. An inverted yield curve is a signal that there is a recession on the horizon. I want to try to show this to you with data. What I've constructed, and I need you to understand what you're seeing on the screen here. What I've constructed is a graph that shows you the yield curve at any given point in time. And right now, that yield curve was as of February 16th, 1977. The argument I'm trying to make is that if that line inverts, there's a recession coming. What these green bars show you is the annualized growth rate six quarters forward. So if the purple line is the yield curve February of 1977, the green line shows you annualized growth rates over the next six quarters after that. So what I need you to see is if you were standing in February of 1977, you wouldn't be able to see the green bars. All you would see is the purple line. The green bars represent the future. What I want to do is take you through history and show you episodes where the yield curve inverted and see what happens to the economy over the next six quarters. So here we go. I'm rolling forward. Okay. We get yield curve inversion. This is October 1978. The yield curve takes on a clearly inverted structure and notice that six quarters out, we get negative 8% GDP growth. I want you to think about that. If you were standing in October of 1978, you couldn't see the green bars. That's the future. But you could see the purple line and it's inverted. And an inverted yield curve means that the markets think that yields to maturity are going to go down in the future. What would make yields to maturity go down in the future is if investors thought inflation was going to decline. And what's most likely to make inflation decline? Recession. And in fact, we see it six quarters later. We see inflation. We continue to see inverted yield curve. We continue to see that recession out on the horizon. I'm going to roll us forward a little bit. Okay, now we're in 1981. March, we have an inverted yield curve, severely inverted yield curve. And notice that one three, four, and six quarters out, we have recession out on the horizon. I'm going to roll this forward a little bit in time. Be patient with me. So I'm just trying to show you that this inverted yield curve is a really powerful signal. Okay, we get to the late 80s. Yield curve inverts April 1989. Six quarters out, we see a recession. All right, let's roll it forward even more. 
Now, one of the things you will see is that the yield curve is a great predictor of recessions, but it's generally only a great predictor of severe to moderate recessions. It's not great at the mild recessions. So coming into the late 90s and the early 2000s, okay, we get, I, I don't know what to call that. It's not really a, an officially inverted yield curve, but it is because at the end it tapers off and that's weird. So we do get inverted yield curve and I want you to notice we get recession four and six quarters out. All right, let's roll this forward to the most recent recession. So we get, I want to show you this. Look, here's normal yield curve. There's normal economic times, but now we start to get some funky action. And notice in 2006, this is super powerful, September 2006, we get an inverted yield curve and notice that six quarters out, we get the recession. Now, I'm not going to call that a super clearly inverted yield curve. Oh, there it is. All right. By January of 2007, we get a very strongly inverted yield curve and there's our recession six quarters out. Now, I would like to point out that the uh, credit spread was probably a clearer indicator of the recession of 2008. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the inverted yield curve was also a reliable predictor. So what's the key takeaway from what we've been talking about recently? We've been trying to come up with measures based on prevailing yields in the bond market from which we can glean information about the macro economy because we believe that the traders in the bond market have access to and are better equipped to analyze and synthesize information about the macro economy. So just by watching the prices in their markets, we can gain information about our financial system and our economy. What we've said is this, when it comes to recessions, the credit spread is the Richter scale. It tells you when the ground starts moving. Today, perhaps even more powerfully, what we've argued is the yield curve, specifically an inverted yield curve, represents the crystal ball, the predictor for recessions. I hope you realize there are very few reliable predictors of the future in this world. But an inverted yield curve has been over the years and decades, a very reliable predictor of recessions. I hope you find this helpful. I think as you launch out into the business world and you start become leaders out in our economy, having the tools to be able to analyze what's happening and what might happen in our economy can prove hugely beneficial in making the right moves to mitigate the risk and navigate the choppy waters.